Okay, so hi everyone, um, and welcome to the closing plenary of the AHG Association of Hydrobox Economics 2021 Annual Conference. My name is Farva Sial. I am part of the AHG Management Committee, and I will be uh, co-chairing today with my colleagues uh, Priya and Arian, uh, who have generously offered um, support with, with the TAC and general housekeeping. So um, apologies for the delay. We're just waiting for our second speaker to join us. Um, but in the meantime, we'll just start and see how, how we go in terms of the order. So this year's um, AG was the 23rd annual conference, uh, which began in early July. And we had under 20 presentations and sessions on a very broad range of topics, including climate change, financialization, ethics, philosophy, um, economics as a discipline, financialization, um, and of course the ongoing crisis. So speaking to these topics, today's closing plenary focuses on tackling racial inequality through heterodox solutions. Um, it's a great honor to welcome today's panelists who are experts in their fields and who have been researching um, racial and gender capitalism for a long period of time. And I say this because you know, their research um, goes beyond the recent BLM movement. Um, and so they will share some important insights building from a large body of um, their individual and collective work. Um, and I will introduce uh, them in an alphabetical order. So our first speaker is Gargi Bhattiacharya. Gargi is a professor of sociology at the University of East London. Uh, they have published widely in the fields of racism, sexuality, globalization, and more recently on austerity, racism, um, and racial capitalism. Some of their books include Dangerous Brown Men, Crisis, Austerity, and Everyday Life, Rethinking Racial Capitalism, Questions of Reproduction and Survival. Uh, their most recent co-authored book is Empire's Endgame, which um, just came in 2021 under Pluto Press. Our next speaker, who is not here yet, um, but hopefully she will join, is uh, Rhonda, Sh Rhonda Sharp. Rhonda is the founder and current president of the Women's Institute for Science, Equity, and Greece. She's a feminist economist who has been faculty member of an extensive list of colleges and universities. Um, uh, and she has served as president of the National Economic Association. And currently she's an elected member of the board of the International Association for Feminist Economics. Our research focuses on three areas, gender and racial inequality, the diversity of STEM, and the demography of higher education. Um, she's also the co-founder with Sandy Garrity of the Diversity Initiative for Tenure in Economics. She's also the recipient of the 2004 Rhonda Williams Prize from the International Association for Feminist um, Economists. Um, our last speaker, eight speaker is William Sandy Darity. Sandy is a Samuel Dubois Cook Professor of Public Policy, African and African American Studies and Economics, as well as a director of the Samuel Dubois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. His research focuses on inequality by race, class, and ethnicity, stratification economics, schooling, and the racial achievement gap, north-south theories of trade and development, skin, shade, and labor market outcomes. It's a very long list. Um, so I'll just pass this, but he, yeah, you can, you can read a lot of his work. He has served as editor-in-chief of the latest edition of the International Encyclopedia of Social Sciences and as an associate editor of the 2006 edition of the Encyclopedia of Race and Racism. His most recent co-authored book is with Kirsten Mullen. It's titled From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. So welcome and thanks to all panelists for joining today. So, so some basic housekeeping rules. The presentations are for 15 minutes each. Um, and then um, I or uh, Ariane or Priya will intervene. And hopefully we have around half an hour for discussion. So to the attendees, please put your questions as well as comments in the chat box. It would be great to have an interactive session. And if you are on social media, um, on Twitter, please use the hashtag AHE2021. So just to also know that the session is recorded, but the recording is on the present presenters and the presentations only. So now I invite the first speaker on the floor. Uh, Gargi, please join us. Okay. Um, 
please could you stop screen sharing so I can try and screen share thanks yeah well maybe I'll just try and do mm -hmm. let's see if this is going to work mm. okay I can see it here let's see if that works oh yes zoom you're so much nicer than teams Thanks so much for inviting me. And as always, I've probably prepared too much and yet prepared too obviously. So I'll say the few things I have to say and I hope we'll have a longer conversation. And I'm not going to do a proper slideshow because then sometimes Zoom doesn't work. So I'm hoping just by drinking it from the outline, it will let me show you. Isn't moving on mine. OK. Um, I was rethinking really about what what the framing of the conversation was this morning. And um, just to remind myself, I was thinking that firstly, we never could, but even more now, we need to remind ourselves that we're always talking about racial injustice at a global scale. That, as um, Farah has already said, that the reignited interest long overdue in the formal state racisms in much of the affluent world and beyond is one aspect, you know, systemic racist violence through the state within national boundaries, often augmented by popular racism, but there's at least two other scales. One is the scale of bordering and the increasingly militarized policing of routes and contact points between richer and poorer worlds, also often between different bits of the poor world now. And the overall lens of um, what climate catastrophe is doing to our global map of entitlement and access to the means of life. And as I'm sure it's no news to anyone that climate catastrophe is already kind of hitching a ride on a long history of dispossession, which means you know the, some of the places that are most hard hit by climate catastrophe are already so depleted and broken by much longer histories of violence. Anyway, that's what I was thinking. So within that kind of three-winged horror, I think that an economics without violence, at the very least, needs to be something that thinks about addressing each of those kinds of zones and strands. And also, if at all possible, the relationship between those zones. But as with so many things, it's much easier to say that than to actually do it. So I've really kind of just put together some thoughts about what I think the question is. When I'd imagined this talk, of course, because it's only 15 minutes, there's not time for this, I'd really imagined this long history of saying the subject of economics, not the discipline itself, although linked to the discipline, but the idea of who can be an economic person, who can be in the world doing economics, who has the um, attributes to engage in economic behaviour, but that itself is so embedded in long racialized histories of who can and cannot be human who is property and who can have property, that we can't kind of retrieve the debate about what economics could be until we look again at that, that shadowy history. There's almost no time to say those things, but let me say a couple of them. As I've already said, all of those imagined contracts of economic life arise from histories of violence, like who becomes stuff and who becomes agent and who can hold stuff and who has the ability to exchange stuff. Um, I think, not as an economist, but someone who reads some of that literature, lots of the discussion in and around the discipline of economics still assumes a kind of indiv individuated actor pursuing individual interests. Not only, but when we think about how things happen, but that's the, it's in the individuated moment that the economic decision is I think still imagined to happen. Although we're seeing, not least through um, debates about global justice and the shifts within development economics and also in feminist economics, much greater acknowledgement of the impact of human relationships. People can correct me. I think it's still quite challenging to imagine collective, collective economic actors and or economic actions which have a consciousness of interdependence especially if it's an inter interdependence that cuts across agency, an interdependence which acts as if I can't be this kind of homo economicus kind of person at all. That made me think, well, 
it might be worth having a little bit of this conversation today about what is economics even really about? And I have these I ideas again as a non as a kind of economics fan, but not an economist themselves. So I think it can be a description of how humans arrange distributions and exchange of resources. The description is not an analysis, but it can also be an analysis of those arrangements and what occurs and with what consequences. Out of those things, clearly it can be a model. That's, you know, if you do get taught economics, it's get taught all the models of, oh, you could do it like this, you can do it like that. And linked to those three things, and forgive me if it's just much more how British education goes, because I'm aware that not, this is not, you know, there's some variations geographically, but this idea that doing those things, describing, analysing and modelling, gives you a means of anticipating what the impact of those particular actions and choices on the arrangements, distribution, exchange resources are. I think that there have been and are still you know, in play quite a lot of attempts to excise the violence from economics in one, two and three. To see what's happening and document it, to analyse how those power relations work, to think about the models. I'm not sure that all the people are trying to anticipate are in the game of excising the violence from economics. And I kind of raise that as something that I'd really like to hear other people in the room say something about. This I didn't have time to do, so I'm just telling you in Kate, because it's reading from other disciplines, probably for many of you. But um, there is a, a, well, there's a huge literature about all the ways in which the coming into the space of economic agency is already historicised in the most violent of ways. One strand that um, I've been thinking about, but I'm in no position to talk about now, is the idea of who can have property. Famous text, Cheryl Harris writing about whiteness as property and the ways in which white privilege, especially in the States, has been actively defended through the exercise of law as if whiteness itself is a, um, a relationship of property to the self. So that other people's mere existence is an infringement on that property and its privileged status. Um, Aileen Morton Robinson talks about the ways in which similar but distinct mythologies of whiteness as the only marker of possessive property have worked in settler colonialism to erase um, native claims to and to make space normalise as the property of whiteness and what that does to the ability of some others, especially those who are facing ethnic cleansing, genocide or displacement, to even be imagined within the economic space. And in a parallel to that, Brenner Banda has written a, a great book about the colonial lives of property and says, well, look, if you want to look at, she's a lawyer, Brenner's work is about property law, but if you want to look at how colonial space is constituted, this idea of those who can never own the space even of their own lives is really core to it and that then law is framed around that. In passing, I think all of that literature and that discussion about how proper, even the concept of property itself is highly racialized, excluding, and is articulated through violence, a, a violence that has, you know, to the end of genocide. That's kind of important if we want to think about what imagining an economics without violence might be. And it leads me to wonder whether economics is actually beyond repair. You know, that's a question I think lots of people are saying about lots of areas of life. I'm very interested in the ways in which people are talking about reparative economics, and I suspect you've been talking about that in other sessions in your conference across different days about how we can use both the techniques and the understanding and the framing of economics um, to think about creating spaces of justice and mutuality and repair and to address long histories of violence. Again, as a, a fan but not an actual participant, some of that work can appear to me to be tied to the imperatives of traditional economics, quite close to demands for corporate social responsibility combined with some greater community responsibility. Um, in different places and transnationally, we're seeing attempts to utilize something like the mechanisms of economic contract 
and concepts of unacknowledged debt to make visible historic and ongoing violence. So you're saying that there's something in the languages of economic contract that can show what is owing and who owes who and why, why that owing happens. It doesn't erase that violent history, but it allows us to formulate and calculate and do something with it, do something with that history of violence rather than both you know, all sides being just transfixed in the moment of violence. Um, although I'm interested in that model of reparative economics, I also wonder if it's a parallel to these other attempted projects, which I have been more involved in about attempted projects of citizenship or human rights. So that this is a model of reparative econo economics that is based in economic contracts that says to achieve economic inclusion and recognition, it has to be on the terms already given including the ability to enforce economic contracts in a meaningful way. So it's about saying there's a table that we're excluded from by the history of racist violence and reparation would be um, all of the amendments that would need to happen for entry and for recompense. Although I think that's all very interesting, and I and I don't I'm not kind of being facetious. I think it's truly interesting, especially as that claim moves across borders and moves from the local to the global. There's also something a bit kind of troubling about it, or things that make me a little bit anxious. And these this is you know I'll try and hurry up a bit. The things I'm trying to describe as the possibility of racial justice against collective survival. In some places. Brit I live in Britain. I live and work and do politics and try and survive in Britain. So, let, you know, let's talk about Britain. In places like Britain, racial justice can be framed as a kind of catching up. So in the face of extremely damaging exclusion and violence and non-protection in the economic realm, so even if you engage in um, economic contracts, your space in the contract is not defended. So it's like, you know, that's partly what Cheryl Harris is saying about whiteness as property. You're not engaging in an economic contract if your claim can never be heard and the other person, the other privileged actor's claim always trumps yours. Racial justice in one place can be framed as a cashing up, undoing of those kinds of violences. I think predictably, I think that framing repeats the dangers of inclusion talk. So you don't change the game, you just include us in it. Just bring me to the same table. And it frames economic enf enfranchisement as something like an aspect of full citizenship. Diversifying affluence, particularly when viewed through a global lens, retains the structures of extractivism and hyper-exploitation. And at the very worst, are reparations designed to include the racially minoritized in extractivist practices, even if but two or three hands removed of the affluent world, can further solidify the barriers between who can who cannot survive climate catastrophe. I won't read out all of this, but I'll tell you my headlines. This maybe I won't say this bit, just to say that there is another dialogue about economic violence that is much more local within homes about how um, people with control can use economic means to like, you know, in domestic violence, stop people having resources, those kinds of things. Um, I think we're trying to try and think of something bigger than that, about how to imagine economic life on other terms. And um, linked to that, a model of economic management, which is kind of always about making capitalism work, which in Britain, I think, is still nearly the only thing ever taught in an economics department, unlikely to save the planet. You know, you could look at lots of things. Here's one picture you know them, what they are. So mending the terms of capitalist inclusion, that's probably not going to allow us to survive. So if we're going to think about collective survival, at the very least, we probably need to have at least a questioning approach to racial justice in one country. And that seems impossible without some much more fundamental reworking of the terms of the global economy in all its key terms. You know, lots of people have been saying this. Um, because climate catastrophe in a world already broken by extractivism and exploitation and dehumanization 
cannot be accounted for within the terms of any approach to economic thought that assumes we have a working model that only needs to be open to the hitherto excluded. I've got one more slide, then I'll finish. Right. Um, so these are lots of ideas on the last slide. So reparation can't be in one place. We have to think about reparation across at least the three lenses. And it has to be not making the model that we already have work, so and we're just included. Alongside all of that, climate crisis really makes us think about the non-centrality of the human. And our mind says stop now. Even amongst some quite unlikely people, suddenly, you know, like the World Bank, there's an unlikely actor. Much bigger sense that um, if you want to think about managing the circulation, use, and exchange of the Earth's resources, you need to attend to the human and the non-human. And we've, as we've already understood that the human has been highly exclusionary and troubled as a label and that the human as economic actor doubly so. Well, I wonder if there's something in the stretching of economic understanding to include non-humans then through a reparative lens which says this is how even amongst those that we know are humans that violence of the marking of the humans um, decided how economic life has been managed and and mobilized and made into violence itself. Um, that might remake our ideas of how to understand the world altogether. And I wonder if we might start to talk about an economics that almost seems unrecognizable to the discipline itself. And yet it's already almost happening as a conversation. I hope, I suspect that's what you've already been talking about, but if other people would like to talk about that, I'm very eager to have that conversation. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Gargi. So you um, you actually had a very provocative question for us, which is: Is um, economic even um, you know salvageable or not? Um, um, no, Rhonda isn't here with us. So Sandy, I would request you to please uh, come in with your presentation. Okay, although I do see Rhonda's. Uh... Oh, yeah, she's here now. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Hi, Rhonda. It will not let me start my video. Yeah, I'll just change that. Yes, I see you. Yes, my, my calendar had this for 10 o'clock, so. Not sure oh. how we got that all confused with the, with the time, but, but I'm here and I'm ready. So let's see, let me get ready to share my screen. So I am going to be talking about the, the, what, what has been heavy on my mind, disaggregating data, but I, I thought I would come, in, come at this a little different and talk about the ways in which we identify in various spaces and how that influences good policy. So the title of my talk is The Intersection of My Identities, The Complexity of Good Policies. So Nina Banks, shared with me this book by Alex Cobham called The Uncounted. And I don't think I had really been thinking about the ways in which politics and power play a role. And, and I know for many folks, it's like, how could you not imagine that or be thinking about that? But he said something in the book that really struck me. He said, being uncounted is not generally a matter of coincidence, but reflects power, the lack of it, or its excess. And it got me to thinking about how we identify in various spaces. And so when I say identity is not static, I don't literally mean that who we are is really changing, but that it is influenced by the politics of a space. So in the US, you know, I am, I think I'm always a black woman. But when I travel internationally, I feel like my Americanness is more of what folks see, not necessarily my blackness. And if I'm in a space with women, 
I, my identity tends to become more about not being married and not being a mother when I'm in a space of women, which is, which should not be, I think, the conversation. And as I participate in on conversations about women coming back to work, I often find that it is not women that we're talking about, but it's mothers that we're talking about. It also makes me think about who has the power in a space because that very much shapes who is thought of as marginalized, who's driving the conversation around policies, and that is very much collected to who has the political voice. I know in the international space with the UN and in various organizations in the EU, there has been conversation about sex disaggregated data, which focuses on differences by sex. And I, I think that there is a, some gender politics in that, that we may not think about. And if I were to put this in the context of the US, it's very much about the power of white women. Right. It is white women who are at the center of the sex disaggregated data and the rest of us are on the margins. Uh, Benga Adjolore, who is a schoolmate of mine and now a senior advisor to the U U.S. Department of Agriculture, posted, you know, sent, sent out this tweet, and I thought this was, was very fitting to thinking about politics, power, and identity, and, poli and policy, and he said, who you center says a lot about who you value, and I don't know how often we actually think about who we're centering says who we are valuing. So as I think about who we're centering, who's what produces good policy, the disaggregation of data, it brings me to think about intersectionality. And I, I was recently listening to a dissertation defense of a former student who is looking at people who have some college no degree versus those who have accumulated uh, or achieved the associate's degree. And she put up this nice picture about intersectionality, thinking about race and gender, thinking about um, ethnicity. Often we, we don't necessarily think about uh, disability, sexual identity, sexual orientation as we think about intersectionality. But, but I also like this this notion by, by Kim Boleg. And in her paper, she was really talking about this term women and women of color and how they don't have to be mutually exclusive, but you will often walk in spaces and it's women and women of color. And I'm often like, well, who are the women? And why is it so difficult for people to put white in front of the women, so we know, you know, it's white women and then women of color, or why is it so difficult for people to disaggregate the women of color and call us as we are Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native American, multiracial, and that might be different depending on who, what, what space you're in. But she talks about intersectionality as a theoretical framework for understanding the multiple social identities, how they intersect, and then how at the micro level of individual experience to reflect the interlocking systems of privilege and oppression, and then how it operates as the, at the macro level of social structure. We like to think about intersectionality as a way to um, interpret your findings, to get that the nuances and frame them in difference, what I refer to as the complexities of me. So when we talk about disaggregation of data, and, and we means the Women's Institute for Science, Equity, and Race, what are we talking about? And, and I want to pause here to make this distinction because intersectionality for us and disaggregation of data are different. For us, disaggregation of data is the mechanics for how we collect and analyze data, and intersectionality is the lens that we use or the framework that we use to interpret it. We often see data dis disaggregated, especially in the U.S., you'll see by education, you'll see race, and sometimes you'll see um, and race and ethnicity intersected with gender. You may see family status, you'll see income, but we don't often see reports that disaggregate data in the ways that Wiser thinks about it 
And that is we want people to disaggregate data by the characteristics that are believed to influence an outcome. And so what does that mean? If I come back to the conversation in the US about the par partic labor market participation of women, especially during the pandemic and childcare. Well, the first is to disaggregate what we mean by childcare. And I would love to take credit for this, but I can't. Fatima Grace Gross, who is the president at the National Women's Law Center, brought to my attention when we we're on another panel talking about women returning to work in childcare, that what was different about this economic downturn is that we saw schools being closed. And so I've been you know, mentioning to, to folks her astute right, notice of, you know, this is about schools and not necessarily about childcare, because I am sure public school systems don't consider themselves part of the childcare system. So even as we're talking about women going back to work, again, I said women, we should be talking about mothers going back to work as a result of childcare, that needs to be disaggregated because it's not the traditional conversation of childcare, usually care for those who are five and below who can't go to the, the public school systems or um, versus talking about school systems being shut down. What we found at the Women's Institute for Science, Equity, and Race is that when you disaggregate uh, data that talks about reasons why women haven't been going back to work, if it's because of child care, that it is women who are married and who have bachelor's degree who are showing um, the greatest amount of stress. And then within that group, it is Asian women. And that's a group that we don't generally hear much conversation about. So in disaggregating the data around childcare as a reason for not going back to work, you, know, you will find nuances if you disaggregate by the characteristics believed to influence marital status, um, education, which may influence the type of job that you have access to. So why is disaggregating data important by the way that Weiser defines it? And we say that it removes cultural bias. Data reported by gender assumes white women are the norm, and this is in particular in the U.S. Um, comparisons to men use the li lived experience of white women, but it also um, removes cultural bias for, by data reported by race and ethnicity where men are assumed to be the norm. Comparison between race and ethnic groups use lived experience of the men of each group. So we actually believe and are strongly advocating for this in, in a variety of spaces and, and hoping to have some influence on the federal government reports as they come out that it will move more to the way that we talk about disaggregating data so that you will see data disaggregated at the intersections of the ways in which people identify to identify the nuances hidden in the aggregate so that we're not just talking about women, but we're talking about Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native American, multiracial, and white women, and the differences that you might see um, in outcomes once we disaggregate. We believe that this will be leads to better policy solutions. I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Rhonda. Um, we'll take the questions towards the end. And to all the attendees, please do put your questions in the chat box. Um, Sandy, please come in with your uh, presentation. Ariane, uh, could you share your screen, please? Arian, are you able to share the screen? Yeah, I was trying. Could you see something? No, not yet. No. Not Let yet. me try again. Uh, 
Uh, if, if you can't put it up, I can talk talk my way through this. Uh, um, let me let me try then, Arian. If you stop, I'll just try myself. Oh yeah, it's working. Oh, there, Great. There thank it you. Is. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I would like to discuss the case that I've been developing for reparations for Black American descendants of U.S. slavery in conjunction with Kirsten Mullen. And it's uh, a case that we present in full in our recent book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to try to cover four, four topics, the meaning of reparations, uh, the eligibility criteria in the United States context, procedures for calculating what is owed, and the question of who is responsible for meeting the debt. Next slide, please. So I'd like to open the conversation with a quotation from Malcolm X, in which he makes a distinction in a situation where somebody has plunged a knife into his back uh, between pulling the knife out and healing the wound. And I wanna emphasize that with respect to the history of atrocities that have taken place in the United States, both pulling the knife out and healing the wound are requirements that must be conducted in this country. Uh, but uh, pulling the knife out is, uh, is a process of ending the harms and, uh, and atrocities, discontinuing them. And that is distinct from actually compensating the victims for the consequences of those atrocities. And so from this perspective, the notion of healing the wound is what's relevant to thinking about reparative justice. And so reparations is an act of healing the wound. Next slide, please. Reparations is a program of acknowledgement, redress, and closure. And by acknowledgement, uh, we mean the admission on the part of the culpable party that they have committed a grievous injustice. And furthermore, they will take steps to engage in restitution for that grievous injustice. So the second component redress is the act of restitution. Frequently it has taken the form of direct monetary payments to the victimized community, particularly when there has been a collective harm that has taken place. Uh, examples of this include the German payments to the victims of the Holocaust and the United States government's own payments to Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated during the course of World War II. Uh, I would add further that uh, the United States has also made payments to individuals who have been subjected to harms uh, when the United States government is not necessarily the culpable party. An illustration of this is the uh, payments that have been made to the individuals who were held hostage in Iran uh, during the time of the Ayatollah Khomeini's regime. Uh, these individuals were paid uh, $10,000 per day of captivity. They were typically captives for 440 days. And so as a consequence, they individually received $4.4 million. The final component of reparations is closure which is the point at which the victimized community and the culpable party come to an agreement that the debt has been paid. Uh, then the victimized community will make no further claims on the culpable party unless there is a renewal of the atrocities or there is a new wave or type of atrocities that take place. Uh, otherwise, uh, the account is settled. Okay. Next slide, please. So uh, next I'd like to address the question of who would be eligible for reparations in the US context with respect to its own racial history of injustice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the criteria that Kirsten Mullen and I have developed are twofold. Uh, first, an individual would have to demonstrate that they have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. And second, they would have to demonstrate that they self-identified as Black, Negro, African-American, or Afro-American on an official document for at least 12 years before the enactment of a reparations plan or the enactment of a study commission for reparations. Next slide, please. Uh, there are three phases of atrocities in the context of the United States is past and present that justify uh, reparations. 
Uh, first is, of course, slavery, the crucible that produced white supremacy in the United States. But the second is uh, upwards of 100 years of legal segregation in the United States, also known as American apartheid and referred to somewhat blithely as the Jim Crow era. This is a period that includes a wave of uh, white massacres that took place in uh, all across the United States. It wasn't, wasn't confined to the Southern states in which uh, there was massive loss of black lives, but most significantly from the standpoint of the issue that we're going to raise about what should be the focal point for reparations, uh, it resulted in significant appropriation and seizure of black owned property by the white terrorists. And then in the present moment, in the aftermath of the civil rights legislation, we have ongoing atrocities, which include mass incarceration, police executions of unarmed blacks, sustained uh, discrimination in credit housing and employment markets. And of course, and this is central to the case being made here, uh, an immense black white wealth disparity. Uh, black American descendants of US slavery are the community that has borne and continues to bear the burden of the cumulative effects of all three of these phases of American racial injustice. Next slide, please. So now I want to address the question of how we calculate what is owed. Uh, next slide, please. So one approach that I initially introduced was to assess the, uh, the present value of the 40 acre land grants that were promised to the newly emancipated in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. These land grants were promised with an eye towards providing restitution for the years of bondage. And uh, I ultimately have estimated that if we were to uh, take this, this, this as a standard, uh, that we would get estimates of the, uh, of the reparations bill in the vicinity of, uh, of four to six trillion dollars, depending upon how the, uh, the estimates are, are actually calculated. But upon further reflection, uh, it became apparent that uh, it was not only the denial of the 40 acres that has resulted in the contemporary racial wealth gap, that there are other policies and practices that the federal government has engaged in that promoted white wealth accumulation to the detriment of black wealth accumulation. And that in effect, in effect uh, the, the black white wealth gap is the best economic indicator of the cumulative effects, the cumulative intergenerational effects of white supremacy. And so the conclusion was reached uh, in our work that uh, we should actually use the racial wealth gap as the gauge for determining how much uh, reparations should be paid. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide that simply indicates that the wealth gap increases as people age in the United States. Whether you examine the wealth gap at the median or whether you examine it at the mean. And uh, it actually increases quite explosively and that's extremely visible if you compare uh, uh, black and white wealth at the, at the mean. Uh, next slide, please. So if we were to close the black white wealth gap, it would require us to target the mean difference in wealth rather than the median. Uh, I think frequently people focus on the median because of the fact that the middle of the distribution is not sensitive to the outlying values at either end of the distribution of wealth. Uh, but in the context of thinking about the black white wealth gap, I think it's imperative that we focus on the mean. And that's for three reasons. First, if we were to erase the entire differential in wealth between blacks and whites in terms of the proportionate shares of wealth that are held by each community, it would require an increase in black wealth of at least $12 trillion. To do that, you would have to target the mean of the distribution rather than the mean, median. Uh, secondly, uh, because wealth is so heavily concentrated in the United States, 97% of the wealth that is held by white Americans is held by households that have a net worth above the white median. And so if you were to focus exclusively on the median, you are taking a vast amount of wealth that is held by white households off the table. Now, the third point is that although people frequently say that this high concentration of wealth is attributable to a handful of white billionaires, 
And, and indeed, there are a handful of white billionaires who have an extraordinarily high share of the nation's wealth, uh, but that's not the whole story. 25% uh, of white households in the United States have a net worth in excess of $1 million. And that's only true for 4% of black households. So uh, the mean must be the target rather than the median. Next slide, please. Okay. Finally, the question of culpability, who is responsible for paying the debt? Next slide, please. So uh, we open this, this, this phase of the conversation by saying black reparations are not a matter of personal or individual or institutional guilt. Black reparations are a matter of national responsibility. And so it's the federal government that must enact a, a reparations plan on behalf of black American descendants of US slavery. Next slide, please. Uh, states and localities are incapable of meeting the bill. Only the federal government has the capacity to meet the bill. If we were to take the combined budgets of all the states and localities in the United States and add them up, this would amount to about $3.1 trillion. And the bill for reparations is at least $12 trillion. So it's an impossible mission for uh, states and localities. Federal government, on the other hand, has demonstrated its capacity to amass huge amounts of funds very quickly without raising taxes in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. The federal government not only is capable, but it is culpable. And this is because of the history of national policies that have produced the wealth gap. First, uh, I mentioned the denial of the 40 acres and a mule for uh, the newly emancipated. But uh, at the same time, the federal government was providing 160 acres land grants under the terms of the Homestead Act of 1862 uh, to one and a half million white American families, including recent immigrants. Uh, and today, this has had the consequence of 45 million living white Americans being beneficiaries of the Homestead Act of 1862. Uh, people frequently talk about handouts being made by the US government, but they uh, frequently ignore the handouts, the substantial handouts for asset building purposes that were distributed to large numbers of white American families uh, under the terms of the Homestead Act. Secondly, it's the federal government that sanctioned 100 white massacres that decimated black communities. The massacres that I mentioned that also resulted in the seizure and appropriation of black owned property. In the 20th century, the federal government shifts its asset building mechanisms away from the provision of land to supporting home ownership. And in this process, uh, these measures were conducted in a highly discriminatory fashion. This includes the practice of redlining, which denied black potential homeowners access to credit on decent terms. Uh, it includes the GI Bill, which was passed in the aftermath of World War II that provided returning veterans with the capacity to make home purchases and to start businesses. Uh, and those resources were overwhelmingly distributed to white returning veterans to the detriment of black returning veterans. And finally, there's a recent book by Dorothy Brown called The Whiteness of Wealth in which she examines the ways in which tax policy continues to promote white wealth accumulation to the disadvantage of black wealth accumulation. So the, the hand of the federal government is central to the crafting of the racial wealth gap. And as a consequence, it's the federal government that has the obligation to eliminate the racial wealth gap. Okay. Final slide, please. So uh, the, the concluding statement is that today's black white wealth gap originated with the unfulfilled promise of the 40 acre land grants. The payment for this debt is feasible if conducted by the federal government and it is at least 155 years overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Zandi. And thank you so much to Gargi, Rhonda, um, for, for their very important insights. Um, I think, um, you know, just, just hearing your 15 minute talk, there is uh, so many layers to everything that you've been saying. And um, I think we need, really need to get to reading your books and your work to understand the depth of it. So thanks a lot for providing these thoughts. Um, 
I'm going to start with a few questions of my own, and then we have some questions in the Q&A. But um, uh, to the attendees, please do jump in and uh, ask a question, raise your hand, um, and let's make it as interactive as possible. So first, I want to just ask um, Gargi, um, thank you for this um, well, provocative um, uh, presentation, but actually it's, it's, it's a very accurate time to ask this question. I mean, uh, what is economics actually doing for uh, you know, uh, uh, the race the gap, the wealth gap, the gender gap? But I think some would say that um, this is not a problem only for economics although it's the underlying uh, basis for which a lot of policy and decision-making happens, uh, what do you think are insights from sociology, for example, you know, the limitations as well as contributions that sociology could make to, make to economics? And of course, I say this fully knowing that, uh, you know, the term interdisciplinarity is also very vague, right? Knowledge by default is interdisciplinarity and it, it becomes disciplines later on. So this is for Gart, for... Um, Boronda, thanks a lot. Uh, this, this, the need for disaggregation of data is, is really, really important. And I wonder what your thoughts are on the recent turn towards uh, behavioral economics, um, not just um, RCTs, but this push towards behavioralism in general. Does it address the problem of uh, the need for disaggregating data or does it make the problem more complex or is there a way to, to balance the two? So, and for, for Sandy, thanks a lot. For those of us who don't live in America, you know, this is a this is such a big myth. You know, how does how does this country continue to operate with such disparity and continue to um, to actually uh, not address any of these problems and and also have a certain attitude towards the broader uh, to the towards uh, the globe in general? Um, could you talk a little bit more about? reparations as well as tax policy because because you know as you mentioned um, if, if if the position is that the federal uh, government has a very big role to play in reparation what about um, complementary policies I mean it has to be an overall uh, kind of a package to address the gap you know? and if you could just go into a little bit detail uh, uh, towards that house ownership mortgages taxation, all of it. So sorry, this is a bit vague, but um, uh, just speaking from someone who's not very much aware of the American context. Um, so we have three questions for now. Do you, do you want me to take all of them or do you want to address this first and come back to it? Can we address these first and then- Okay, sure. Ahead? All right, sure. sure. So was, I thought the first question was, for Gargi. Gargi. Okay, so you want to take in that the same order you ask them? Is that yeah. how you want to? Okay, yeah. right. Well, thanks so much. And um, of course, I don't mean that. Um, firstly, I don't think this is the end of economics, and I don't think it's the question for economics alone. But I think there's something about the moment we're living through in terms of how um, the question of racial justice is being rearticulated of course, through Black Lives Matter, but how that is then taken up in other locations and how it then speaks to a global push for migrant rights in a time when we have, you know, kind of climate apartheid is very much around the issue of who can move and who cannot move and who is kept in place. Those things are all coming together in a way that I think certainly across the social sciences and really I think across human endeavours to know, understand and kind of navigate the world but abolitionist push to say don't just tinker with the state is also an abolitionist push to say all those ways of learning which have been captured by the powerful as ways of just limiting what an amendment to their power could be can't really function like that anymore or not function in good faith you know it requires a, a different expansiveness about how we speak to each other and um and even, you know, I am kind of interested in behavioural economics as well. I know that's for a very, very different purpose about, well, what if economics was not, you know, what, what is economics for? You know, what, what is this thing called economics and what is it trying to do? Yes, it's in some places saying we just about have a functioning government, functioning in inverted commas, 
that enacts policy, which is also policy in the economic realm, what does it do? But there's also the, always the bigger underlying question in what is in economics is, how do th living things in the world called humans manage the business of resource allocation, distribution, and exchange in a way? You know, that's kind of a bigger interesting question and much more interdisciplinary question. And do we have any tools available that can be stolen back from the business of keeping the rich rich to actually do this thing of like, what, what would it mean? What would um, racial justice mean not only in one place, and I'm, but in one place, but also across places? Are there tools that can be taken from the US case for um, reparations for African descendants of slaves that can be reworked to talk about, well, what would a global racial justice across borders mean? I mean, I think there's some conversations happening about that, but it feels quite hard to hold in your head. And it certainly doesn't seem to me like um, beyond description and analysis. I, If people in the room have a way of thinking about how we then anticipate and manage, so like, you know, what would be a policy intervention rather than a, corrective i'm really keen to hear it but then it imagines so many other things doesn't it, it imagines both a social environment in which those relations could happen and institutions of not necessarily of dominance i think policy often imagines that, that you know a big cop will come somehow and make it happen what if we didn't have a functioning institution of dominance how would we make those relations happen? Now I say all those things absolutely knowing that they feel like, oh, what unicornish kinds of stories to tell each other, that we don't yet have any of the components. But I do think part of the job of people who have even a little bit of time in their lives to read books and think about ideas is to think about, well, I don't want to spend my last, you know, whatever many days I have on earth imagining how my knowledge and imagination can make the violence of the world slightly less violent in some places. I want at least the intellectual imagination to be, well, what if we had the collective ability to imagine what living without violence would be? That doesn't mean we have the capacity yet to live without violence or that we have the mechanisms or the institutional roots, but there is something in the conversation across all disciplines, which is, well, you know, Sociology comes from the idea that human beings' behaviour needs to be um, characterised in collectives in order to understand how the world is working. Economics roots comes from the idea that um, to understand the contracts that happen between human agents to distribute resources, you know, there's something in how the world was split in the birth of all our disciplines that you feel like, oh, you just shake it up and start again. Or just imagine starting it again, that you could might have a different a different story and you know, I've been saying in some places even to stop the key words you know what if you said that the key word in economics was mutuality that changes it that changes exchange doesn't it so I have no idea without seeing the audience whether this lands at all so I'm going to stop talking now in the hope that some of the audience will speak and I'll be able to know whether we're in a dialogue at all Thanks, Gargi. Um, um, yeah, yeah, many thoughts. Rhonda, please go ahead. Well, I'm I am not I am not sure how how I am going to go ahead. I'm not really paying much attention to what's going on with behavioral economics. And as I let me know if I understood your question correctly, and that is whether or not in thinking about disaggregating data, if behavioral economics would exaggerate some of the problems that may come from disaggregating or solving the problem? Did I understand your question somewhat correctly? Yeah, it's actually about solving the problem, yeah. Um, okay, so so I've only, I, okay, so I don't know much about behavioral. I've seen very few experiments, of the, re, the results of them. And I, the way that I think about disaggregating data is, coming in at the forefront and, and thinking about what might influence. And so my notion is in behavioral, they do something very similar, right? There is this notion that you have told me that this is 
that this is how you're going to behave, this is what you think, and then they sit you through a set of experiments to actually see if that actually is the ways in which we respond to incentives, we're consistent in our behaviors, our thoughts, et cetera. Right. Now, that's, that's how I understand behavioral and, and the way that I've seen experiments. Um, so I'm not sure, I haven't thought about how that plays out in terms of, um, of thinking about disaggregating data, right? So the, the one experiment that, and I saw this eons ago, was Catherine um, Eccles' experiment about trust. Right. People saying, you know, they're quite trusting, but it was very clear that there was a particular face that they did not deem to be trustworthy. Um, and as I think about disaggregating data, for me, it is not the person who you would be putting front and center, not their characteristics, but the characteristics of the person on the other side. So is there something about the individual's class? Is there something about their race, their identity that allows them to view people in a particular way? Um, and my, con my concern with that, I think, goes back to the notion of power. And that is, if you find that there are characteristics that suggest particular characteristics are likely to view folks as less trustworthy. And I think what we tend to see is the face on the other side, not the person who is actually doing the viewing. I'm not sure that many of us are ready, ready for disaggregation in that way, because it will lead us to much of the conversation around power structures, that those who are in power are viewing those who don't have power in a particular way. And I also worry that for some of us, it could be the, uh, a revelation in the ways that we have assimilated certain beliefs about populations, right? So I don't know that that it will necessarily make, I don't know, I don't know, right? I think that's my whole idea of disaggregating data is not to assume in the aggregate, right? Is to do the nuances so that we can see what, um, how people are responding and if there are similarities so that you can structure particular policies. And I don't always mean that in the public policy realm, but it also could be everything from courses to um, training and, and education. Thank you. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, let, me, uh, let me make a couple of preliminary comments that are not directly related to reparations. Uh, the first is that I think that there is a, a new emerging subfield in economics that addresses questions of identity, multiple identities, intersectionality, uh, and, and, and which identities are privileged and which identities are marginalized and what happens if an individual possesses an identity that's marginalized and privileged at the same time. So uh, that's stratification economics. And I, I, I would encourage people to consider that as a, a route to thinking about the types of questions that Rhonda is, is raising at a theoretical level. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I think that one of the central problems that may be underlying uh, Gargi's concerns is the, is the fact that I think economics starts with the premise frequently, con conventional economics, that, that scarcity is the fundamental condition that human individuals are confronted with. And I would like to propose, and I'm going to try to do this, I hope, in a, in a presentation I'm going to give to the Southern Economics Association. I would like to propose that actually there are alternatives to thinking about scarcity, which is something that is socially constructed in the first place. There are alternatives to thinking about scarcity as the fundamental area or cornerstone of economic analysis. And I'd like to propose that people consider either Keynes's emphasis on uncertainty or Amartya Sen's emphasis on inequality. Uh, if we start with uncertainty or inequality as the foundation for economics, it leads us in a very, very different direction. Uh, but then with respect to the question that you raised about how to do reparations, from my perspective, the way in which you eliminate the racial wealth gap is by eliminating the racial wealth gap, by making direct payments to individuals who are marginalized uh, due to a variety of historical and present processes. I am less concerned about this notion of itemizing 
specific types of assets. Uh, I think what you do is you give individuals the resources and you let them arrange their portfolio as they see fit. So instead of giving people housing vouchers, give them general monetary payments, which would allow them to purchase a home if they so desire, but it would allow them to do other things. And with respect to the question of the uh, marginalized community uh, entering into full participation in an oppressive system, uh, you know, the question becomes, what is the marginalized community's attitudes about what the political climate should be in their country? And if they have a different set of resources, perhaps they will create the political conditions that would alter the character of that country. Uh, personally, I'm an advocate of an economic bill of rights for the 21st century, which would be applicable to all Americans. And it would include a federal job guarantee. It would include a guarantee of, uh, of medical insurance for all Americans and so forth. You know, United States is this odd country that doesn't provide medical care for everybody. Um, and so, uh, so that, that's, 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 that's my thinking. And I would think that if Black Americans were empowered financially, they would have more of a capacity to promote that type of social arrangement in the United States. And so, uh, you know, maybe I'm excessively optimistic, but, uh, uh, but and, 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 and one final point, yes, the U.S. is both presumptuous and hypocritical to complain about human rights uh, violations in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Rhonda and Gargi. So we have almost eight questions uh, now. Uh, I see Sandy has already been answering some of them here. Uh, so maybe what I'll do is I'll collect uh, them as they are directed to presenters. Um, let me... So the first question is for Rhonda. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, um, how does the literature you conceptualize um, when looking at identities overlap in a contrary way? Say you are African-American and you enter in a British black community. So how does that uh, overlap or contrast, I think is the question. Secondly, what role of language in different communities uh, is at play with regards to identity, identification, and maybe otherness. Um, so this is a very specific question. Um, this is so. This is for Rhonda. Then for Sandy. Um, so the example of UK. Uh, what do you think about the UK as a way to power reparations to African Black British communities? Um, second question is: Do you think that US should be eligible for repaying overseas nations. I think you sort of mentioned it, but uh, examples of Afghanistan, Vietnam. Do contributions of African-Americans in these wars and many atrocities, uh, for example, the My Lai Massacre, complicate things in terms of repaying them for slavery if they were committing similar actions overseas? Um, and then there's a question for Sandy. How, realis how realistic do you think any form of compensation is in the current political climate? Uh, this is by Karen Helwig Peterson, um, and the question goes on, I think Congress is studying it, but realism in a situation where water suppression is increasing rather than, uh, rather than the opposite. So what would the economic consequences of your proposal be? Jeff Powell has a question also for Sandy. Um, so uh, also he, he's saying that you didn't talk about how the required funds would be raised. Isn't this an essential part of the story? If not, might not the response of a federal administration be to cut public sector spending to afford the reparation bill? If by tax rises, what taxes on who? So scarcity if I, principle. sorry? The scarcity principle. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, Jeff is being provocative here. I know him, so I know he's being provocative. And then there is a question for Gargi. So um, much of the economics research today, including heterodox relies on models that are claimed to be based on heterogeneous agents that would be able to account for collective action, unequal treatments, bounded rationality, complexity, and so on. How do you see these, this claim that economic models already offer the tools to deal with the issue you presented? Um, I think I have most of the question. Um, there's a, again, there's a question for, for um, 
for Sandy, should countries like Liberia not be included in any reparations? Uh, I'll just leave it to that now. So uh, you can choose okay, who so goes first. Let me, let me start by saying, and I'm going to miss some of these, so please help me. Yeah. Um, let me start by saying that the case for reparations for a particular community from a particular perpetrator does not obviate or eliminate the potential for cases that can be made by other communities or other nations. And so, uh, so I, I, I just, I think that there's something deflective about asking, well, what about this group or what about that group? Uh, because it's a, it's a way of creating a detour that pushes you away from paying attention to the case that's actually being made. Uh, and, and there's absolutely no question that African Americans who were in the military may well have engaged in atrocities in a number of places across the globe, but that's irrelevant to the question of the atrocities that have been committed by the United States government toward that community. Now, if uh, a claim is going to be made on the US government for the Malay massacre and the like, that's entirely appropriate, but it's a different case. It's a different claim from the one being made here. When, um, when, uh, when Germany made payments to Israel and to the victims of the Holocaust, you know, that doesn't uh, obviate a claim that the Palestinian community might have on Israel. Uh, it doesn't obviate the claim that the Nama and the Herero people in Southern Africa had on Germany. Uh, but do we then say that Germany should not have paid restitution for the Holocaust because they failed to pay it in other cases as well? And, and my position is no, that, that's, that's, that's a nonsensical position. So, uh, so that, that, that's how I'd like to respond to this question of overseas uh, atrocities that the United States has committed. Bring the claim forward. It's if it's if it's suitable, fine. But don't use it as a mechanism for deflecting the claim that Black American descendants of U.S. slavery have on the U.S. government. Yeah, and I think then then this also follows to the next question about how will you raise that money? Uh, uh, yeah. Is it those funds? So, so one of the points I, I was trying to make in the slideshow, and I did it very very briefly, was that the recent funding for the CARES Act, for the American Rescue Plan and the like, indicates that the United States government has the capacity to spend huge sums of money without raising taxes. Uh, the only barrier, so, so I, I'll, I'll confess, I, I, am, uh, I am an MMTer, uh, but the only barrier to increased spending by an entity that has a sovereign currency is the potential for inflation, uh, for high inflation. And so that's something that has to be taken into account when there's any new expenditure uh, initiative. And it's one of the problems that's associated with what recently has been done because we are now seeing the emergence of relatively higher rates of inflation in the United States. Uh, and this is because the type of expenditure that was conducted was conducted in such a way that there was no accompanying uh, in comparable increase in production in the U.S. economy. Uh, in fact, as a consequence of the pandemic-induced recession, we actually had a destruction of productive capability in the economy. So, uh, so of course, you're now going to see some evidence of inflation. Uh, and, and that's a possibility with any of these programs or initiatives that might be developed. We propose, in, in, in From Here to Equality, two steps to minimize the inflationary effects of a reparations plan. The first is to distribute the, the funding over the course of a decade. We don't want it to last longer than that, but if you distribute it over the course of a decade, each individual year, the amount of spending would not be as great. And secondly, you could actually design the, uh, the direct payments in such a way that they're comparatively less liquid. Uh, so, for example, you could give people part of the payments in the form of a trust account or some type of endowment that could not be spent immediately, and this would also mitigate the inflation effects. But that's, that's all we really have to worry about is how much inflation we're producing, 
uh, it's not a question of having to take Rob Peter to pay Paul. Thanks, thanks, Sandy. Um, Rhonda, would you like to go next? I was about to give Sandy most of the space and just type my question. Um, so so I, I don't see it as an African-American entering into a black British community as being contrary. So, so I'm, I'm not sure that I make that connection, but I, I, so I'm not sure what the point, like, I don't know how to address that as much as I see that as an instance of maybe power in a particular space. And so, um, as, as I said sort of earlier, my experience with being a woman, being in spaces with women, and, um, and, I, and I think you mentioned this in terms of being othered because I may not be a mom, right? So, so I see it from that perspective, that it's about the power in that space in terms of how the, the African-American entering into that community is going to be treated as well as, um, I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I think the other part with respect to language is an important part of identity. In the U.S. census, they ask the question generally about speaking Spanish. Uh, I'm sorry, whether or not you speak English, right? The per level of proficiency with respect to English. And so I think that is an important identifier and um, often important when we're looking at labor market outcomes and occupations to disaggregate by not only nativity, citizenship, but also by, by language. So I don't separate language out as we're, uh, in terms of thinking about disaggregation. We start with what do you believe to be the characteristics to influence the outcome? That's the starting question for us. And then you disaggregate accordingly. And if language is one of those characteristics, then you would disaggregate by language. Gargi, would you like to take the question? Uh, you're on mute. Yes, sorry. Can you just remind me of the question? Sorry, because I've been typing in the chat, so now I've um, lost track of where we are in the conversation. Yeah, it was about uh, economic models. Um, oh, yes, I remember. Yes. OK. And um, all the ways in which heterodox economics has ways of recognizing variation and difference. I'm not at all saying all economics only thinks of this one kind of homo economicus. I'm saying, oh, if you really try, to, if you try to say to an alien, what kind of thing is economics? Still, when you peel away all the things, it's an idea that there's something called an economic actor and you might understand more and more things about who and what an e that economic actor is. And this is the thing they do. And that's a different from the social actor, it's different from the political actor. One of the things that probably all of us are saying in different ways is that, um, of course, it's always been, economics is even known in, even in its most classical modes, there's a fictionality about the economic actor without the politics and the social. Um, so I'm not saying, oh, if only economics could be a bit more socially aware, maybe that would be good, maybe it wouldn't, but that's not the question. The question is more that all, all of us who are trying to imagine justice in a world where we are able to document many centuries of violence, racialized violence, but not only racialized violence, there's a question in the chat as well about where is class in this. All of us, we've got all these resources. We know that that's long histories of violence and we have certain techniques that are, are refracted through ways of thinking and intellectual traditions that say, well, maybe we could manage the world slightly better, maybe more efficiently, um, but maybe more justly. So we're all people who've been trained to kind of learn to ma uh, manage the world more efficiently, because that's what the dominant says. Different, you know, some interpretation around efficiency. You could have efficiency with welfare. You could have efficiency without war, but you could have it just with corporate takeover. But you know, basically, universities will teach you to operate in a world as if the world nearly works, and a little bit of a better application of the knowledge of the dominant class will make it work better. And yet, when we learn that, we can think. Oh, well, maybe this whole way of operating the world can both, I can see it for the violence it is because of, precisely because of the dominant knowledge that I've been given, and I can imagine it operating 
completely differently. And so it's really only the push to that. And I can see that there are ways in which the expansion and dismantling of what economics can be is already part of that journey. I'm only interested in what the coupling of economics and making and remaking itself alongside other kinds of political and disciplinary tradition might take us to. I mean, some of the people in the chat clearly think, think I've come here to say, oh, you ugly ec economic students. You kind of think, look, I love it. I love the stuff you do. I'm not of it, but I think it's absolutely part of it. I, when I say it's about exchange, I don't say, oh, how limited you are. But I wonder if there is something to be said, to be reclaimed about saying, are we going to imagine a world where ex the exchange of resources is not part of management? I don't think we are. OK, what are our resources for thinking about what doing that justly and as an exercise in justice within one nation, across nations and borders and globally? I think we might get there, you know. I think this moment of crisis, I think climate crisis might force what we're able to imagine. Because it, not for great reasons, but you know, it's forcing the question, isn't it? In, in all kinds of ways, all at once. So our job is at least to be open and alert to the question, not that you'd have necessarily always a didactic way of saying, oh yeah, we'll do this and then we'll be there. But it's, it seems, a waste of our collective resources to live in a world on fire with blood in the streets in every street and not to say to each other, do you think that we might together know something that could do something about that? And to do that, first we have to say, yeah, this is the question. The question is not only in one place, it's in one place in this horrible way and yet in all the places and the places are interconnected. That, well, that's partly the conversation we're having, isn't it? When people say, what about the US as an imperial power? Well, yes, yes and yes, isn't it? Our job is like to use our collective resources to think those things together, not in a way to catch each other out, but to, um, to build a hive mind model of what freedom might look like, which is not taught in any one discipline, but exists in our collective capacity as humans. I'm very optimistic. I know it doesn't sound like it. I guess it, maybe if you get trained in economics, the optimism gets beaten out of you a bit more. But it's there, you know. We built the world as it is and we can build it better. It's our, you know, the thinking is part of it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Gargi. I mean, I think what's interesting is that a lot of these questions seem very far away. Um, and they're right now, they're just, you know, right in front of us. And, and maybe actually we need to have a panel where uh, anthropologists, sociologists, and uh, well, normal people would ask these questions to all economists, heterodox or not, and then try to map and gauge their response because that could be a very interesting exercise. Um, so we've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists uh, for making time. Uh, this was really, really useful. I hope we can have another session uh, in the future. And sorry about the glitches and the delay. Um, this is, um, we're going into some kind of slow holiday period so at least in, in a, I guess in a western sense so thanks a lot once again for coming and hope uh, we again um, thank you to the attendees also for making time thank you bye